Welcome to another installment of Innovation Crush. It's me, Chris Denson. Uh, today, I actually want to rename the show. I'm, I'm going to do uh, Chris Makes Everything Better. <laughs> um, so I'm here with Adam Conover. Say hello, Adam. How hello. are you? Hello. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. Uh, thank you for being here live at the SAE Institute. Oh, very, very, what is the SAE Institute? <laughs> it, well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, it is a uh, an amazing audio engineering school. I have 53 oh, cool. campuses all over the world. And so uh, Innovation Crush is recorded and produced here. So. Cool. I was a little bit worried it was kind of like a Scientology type organization. It there's, is. There's like a big old <laughs> logo coming in. It's like SAE. And so there's like some like smooth music playing. I was like, this is like, this is this feels very, I feel like I'm in a, uh, 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 oh, God, what's his name? Yo. The guy who directed the movie about. I was going to say Ray Kurzweil. No, but what's the the um, crap? P.T. Anderson. I yes. thought he was in a P.T. Anderson movie. <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing will happen bad to you here. <laughs> okay, good. But it's, uh, how familiar are you with Scientology? That sounds like firsthand with the oh, music a, and you know I've what the lobby a, is. I've been like a fan. I, you know, like I got I got into, uh, you know, reading about Scientology became, you know, become, became a little bit of an obsession for me over a couple of years. I, you know, wanted to learn a whole lot about it. I found it very fascinating as a, as uh, you know, topic like the history of it and stuff like that, and then let's save that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, in case you in case you guys are tuning in for the first time, this show covers all things innovation, ideas, smart people doing smart things, and today the buck does not stop. I'm glad you're here. Um, kind of give the people a little bit of a 101 on who Adam Conover is. Sure. Well, I'm a comedian. I do a show on True TV called Adam Ruins Everything. Uh, that's sort of like a informational comedy show. We use sort of uh, synthesize sort of stand up and sketch comedy uh, to. Uh, uh, tell you the awful truth about you know everything you ever took for granted is basically the the theme of the show. I love your uh, your your background and like the, some of the things I've read is just like this is kind of an extension of just who you are naturally. Yeah, very much so, very <laughs> much. I mean, it came out of I, I started as uh, you know while I was doing comedy, I also uh, you know uh, I'm sort of like an information sponge. You know, like I listen to podcasts, I read magazines, and you know not uh, uh, you know nonfiction stuff like that. I listen to audiobooks in my car and listen to music stuff like that. So. Um, and then when I sort of started combining those, you know, comedy and information is when things really started going. Where where did that curiosity come from? I don't know. I think I was. Uh, I I guess it's just sort of how how I am. You know, I grew up. I grew up in an academic family. My my parents are all. My jokes. I'm the only member of my family who doesn't have a PhD. So I'm like the big you know failure in my family because I, I I have a bachelor's like a dropout. Are you, you know? telling these jokes? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> So yeah, uh, uh, you know they they sort of brought me up, uh, you know, very inquisitive. I watched a lot of you know like science TV when I was a kid, and um, uh, you know had a, had a firm grounding in that kind of thing. And then you know I went to uh, uh, when I went to I, I went to a liberal arts college called Bard College that was very much like you know it's very much like life of the mind, like you'll read the <laughs> philosophy and wonder, question why, and and that that sort of ethos like really like took hold in me. Like I really fell in love with that, and and so. So that's sort of like the uh, like the ethos that I took. You know, but not only are your, are your are your family members PhDs, they're most of them are scientists, right? So yes. oh yeah, they're all scientists. It's, yeah. it's interesting that like you know the question of why, like isn't that part of the scientific process? Is like keep asking why five times. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's the you know it's uh, the the search for. Uh, you know, the truth, but then also, you know, everything, you know, everything in science is a theory more or less, right? It's, it's all, it's all held as true until it's been disproven or until it's, you know, until we have uh, more information. Or, you until, know? or until you come along. Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, I, and I studied philosophy in college, which is the same sort of thing where philosophy is a constant undermining of, of what you think, you know, you know, it's constantly, well, why do we, why do we know, you know, here's what we think. Why do we think it? Why, where did this belief come from? You know, uh, that, that sort of constant question. And I, I, I like the term undermining, you know, the, like you, you, you never rest on what, uh, on your own beliefs. You always, you know, go underneath them again and, 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 uh, dig the ground up from under them and say, okay, are these really on a firm foundation or not? You know, that's interesting. Uh, Cause even in the vein of the show, right. Debunking a lot of things that we believe to be mm -hmm. true. Um, you know, whether it's weddings or the beers and the diamonds <laughs> and all, right. all those things. Um, I, I don't know, just about that process of the getting to the why and getting to what we believe. What have you learned about people's beliefs and how to change them? Like, why do we believe these things? And you're like, oh... And, uh, well, and people. Well, people believe you know uh, what they're presented with. You know, it, it, it's it's uh, uh, not 
like uh, you know, it's not like people are are lazy or or stupid, which is what a lot of cynical people believe. You know, um, everybody I believe wants to wants to know more, wants to know the truth. Is you know, everyone has has sort of a deep down curiosity and love of learning, right? It's just a lot of people are too busy <laughs> to engage right. in it, right? You know, they 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 uh, you know they've got kids, they got a they got a job, um, you know, they don't have time to you know go read a, a you know a long nonfiction book or whatever, right? Um, in, in order to find out the truth about things, so there's sort of the purpose of our show is to is to uh, take the work of you know scientists, journalists, s- scholars, people like that, and put it into a format that like anyone can have access to. Right. You know, um, uh, but uh, you know as to why uh, people believe the things they do, it, it's just. You know that's the uh, that's the information that's been repeated and that's been presented to them. You know, like like people say, uh, you know, um, uh, like a common. Oh, I think a lot of people know that this isn't true, um, uh, but maybe they don't. You know, there's the common line about like, oh, people only use ten percent of their brains. You know, um, uh, that's not true. There's no study. Use that's way a, less. <laughs> well, there's no study. <laughs> Actually, you use uh, pretty much all of it. You know, there's no part of your brain that isn't being used. You know, this th- that that. Uh, uh, statistic, it doesn't it doesn't come from anywhere. It's it was like a misreading of a line that a, a particular psychologist said in like 1910, and then it's just something that's like repeated in the media, you know. So why do people believe it? Because it's been repeated to them thousands and thousands of times, and because it helps tell a story that we want to believe about ourselves, which is that there's more potential in us than we're using, right? Everyone wants to believe that that they can be more than they are. You know, you know what you just did? You what? just is very meta. You just ruined one of my favorite movies, oh. <laughs> which is uh, Lucy. Have you yeah, seen that movie? I've not seen it. I'm surprised. It's your favorite movie? Well, I, well <laughs> it's it's kind of because it is very philosophical. It's like yeah. here's what happens at twenty percent. Like they all cut yes. to black, and like she yes. unlocks all her, you know, her brain and potential. That's, and that's commonly, you know, that's used in a lot of like you know movies and sci-fi novels and stuff like that because it's a wonderful concept. You know, like the idea that there's that that we can be more than we are, and that we have all this unlocked potential. You know, but it, uh, but we, we don't. Yeah, it's not. We have no potential. No, we have potential. <laughs> we have potential. There's there's like tons of plati- plasticity in the brain. The brain can grow and change. You know what I mean? But like this particular line that people say. Well, it's just been repeated, and it and it helps tell a story. But but you know, if you as soon as you present that to some to people, if you present it right, you know the the truth about it, they're like, oh well, okay, and they start you know they start thinking about, oh yeah, now that I think about it, that doesn't make any sense, you know, right? Um, <laughs> I mean, does. Do you want this show or your perspective yeah. beyond the show j- to really change the way people think and uh, approach the things that we encounter on a day to day basis? Yeah, I hope so. Because you're doing a lot of heavy lifting for us, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I hope it encourages people to be more critical of of what they're told, you know, and to be more questioning. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I mean that's the, that's what I uh, that's what I hope. I, I I hope it'll you know cause people to see the world in a different way and to sort of build that habit of mind of of you know being curious and not just accepting common wisdom. That that's that's definitely what what we're trying to put into the world for sure. Uh, and I, uh, you know, my, a lot of my career is kind of from a marketing perspective, right? Sure. And you gave a great talk recently about, or I think it was late last year about. Yeah. There's no such thing as millennials. Yes. And I think most brands believe all these things about their audiences. Or if you're an entrepreneur and you're starting a company, you're like you believe the world is a certain way, right? Uh, and you believe the world is a certain way because of a history of events. And you kind of like map those things out and almost prove most of it wrong. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, you know, I don't know if you've done, in, done any work with brands, but, you know, even on a macro level, you know, there's this sort of macro story that we believe is as an industry. Mm-hmm. Um, how, how I don't know. How would you recommend we approach marketing, you know, based on? Oh, that's a really good. That, well, that's a really interesting question. Um, uh, I mean, I don't know if I have an approach for how to how to approach marketing overall. My. My focus as a comedian has always been to look at what I like, you know, and to assume, hey, that's what other people like. And they they have the same wants and desires I do, you know. So, like, my show never talks down to anybody, you know. I never say, oh, the audience wants this or the audience wants that, you know. Um, and so let's give them this even though we're smarter than them, which is the approach that a lot of TV shows and a lot of, you know, I think brands take, you know. Um, uh, they make assumptions about what their audience makes and they and they pitch it to that. But um, uh that has the result of making people feel condescended to, you know? So my show always starts re- instead from the point of view of like, uh, uh, of like, you probably feel like this, right? Like if you're like me, you feel this way. Isn't that weird? Don't you want to know this? Don't you want to know the answer to that? Like, you know what I mean? Right. Um, uh, and so we, you know, I really try to imagine what is the actual point of view of, you know, the people watching the show at home, uh, assuming they're as smart as me, they're as curious as me, you know, they're, they're, they're as lazy as I am. You know, that we're, we're all sort of in the same 
same headspace and trying to use that <clears throat> as a as a starting point. Um, the millennial talk came from. Um, uh, the desire to sort of, uh, uh, you, you know, a big focus for me is that uh, a lot of the ideas we break down on the show are um, uh, lenses that we put in front of the world to describe it to ourselves, you know, as mm. a society, right? So generations are a perfect example of that, right? Like the biggest point of the generation of the, of the, there's no such thing as millennials, there's no such thing as generations idea for me is that like, generations are a very convenient way to break down the world. Baby boomers are like this. Gen Xers are like that. And millennials are like that. Right. And it helps you, you know, you make statements about them and then right. you, it's, it's, you know, it's what we call a heuristic, you know, where it's, it's a, uh, a, a quick way to put people in buckets and to make statements about them. And that doesn't mean it's entirely untrue. Right. But it is also a human imposed way of looking at the world. If right. you're an alien who comes to earth or if you're God looking down on earth, right. You're like, I don't know what the fuck these generations are. Uh, there's, can I swear on your show? Oh. Too late now. Okay, well, no, okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, you can. It'd be like, I don't know what the hell these generations are. They're, these are just, all I see is a whole lot of people who are all alive, right? There's people who go from age zero to age 105 or however old the oldest person is. And there's like, seems to be a smooth gradient. I don't see any divisions in, in these people at right. all, right? But for some reason, we've got this idea that, you know, that, that like people are somehow divided into these groups and they're, they're simply not, right? And so uh, from my perspective, now look, sometimes those uh, those uh, uh, boundaries or those lenses are useful for in certain specific uh, cases, and there's probably you know they're probably useful to a certain extent. That's why they became popular, right? But but uh, most of the time. In my opinion, this is where I start to editorialize. Um, they lead you into error, right? Um, they, they, you make mistakes as a result of over relying on those on those lenses or those heuristics. Mm. And so, it's very important. A lot of my goal is to bust people out of those ways of thinking. I actually ended up talking to the psychologist uh, who we uh, showed a clip of in the Millennial Talk. Her name is Jean Twangy, and she talks about the generations. And we showed a little clip of her, and I, I sort of made fun of her a little bit. And, um, and and I eventually talked to her, and she was like, "Hey, look, a lot of the phenomena I'm talking about, you know, when I talk." about generations is like real, like, like people now do have, you know, if you interview them or you, you know, you do a study, they actually are a little bit different than people who are older, you right. know? And I wouldn't dispute that. I wouldn't say that there's no difference between people who were born in 1990 and people who were born in 1950, you know? Um, and that nothing has changed. One talks like this. Yeah, exactly. Society has, <laughs> society has changed. Right. But if you, uh, but what I'm trying to do is bust people out of this sort of lens that they're using because people start to treat it as though it were a like real thing, you know? know, as though it were like a literal fact about people, as though people like came in, you know, came with a label slapped across their head, millennial, and right. that, and that determined 90% of their personality. Um, even that, like, I know I like to refer to it as you're millennial minded. And even if, you know, even that construct is kind of flawed, right? You, mm -hmm. you know, I think I kind of look at these universal human truths. Like you said, if you look at one homogenous world, it's like, we all sort of want the same things, acknowledgement, opportunity, yeah. people around us, storytelling, like the, there's these things that exist. And even from a millennial standpoint, you're like, oh, millennials don't like to own things like yeah but when they once they want to get married and have a kid they're going to want to own a house in a car yeah. like exactly. you're like, just talking about young people right uh, you know a lot of a lot of things people say about millennials are just things that old people say about young people they're lazy they're entitled they want this you know that's uh, you know in that piece we went back and showed how that's exactly what you know the greatest generation quote quote marks said about baby boomers said oh they just want to be handed a job they don't want to work for anything like we did you know that kind of thing and then when you look at you know people oh millennials are so connected they spend their whole lives online yeah, so does everybody. My mom spends more time <laughs> exactly. on Facebook and Twitter than I do. You know, yeah. Um, so a lot of these, a lot of these divisions are are phantasms. And then at the, but you know, at the end of the piece, we talk about, hey, there are some real differences. Like, for instance, demographically, millennials are different just because of the changing sort of face of America. You know, ethnically, right? Um, in terms of how many of them are immigrants, how many of them are, you know, et cetera. Um, uh, the the you know state of the world that they grew up in. You know, the way the economy is different now than it was before. You know, right. but the idea that like they have some sort of like different personality is like, is like pretty silly. You know, I'll, I'll give you another example. We talked about, um, on the show, we've done a thing about purebred dogs, right? Um, and people think that like dogs come in dog breeds. You know what I mean? Right. Like, like that's how dogs like and like as though like God created them that way. Like I'll create the the basset hound and the and the pug, and then every dog is a mix of different pure breeds. It's you know people say, oh, what's your dog? Oh, they're a quarter this and they're sixteenth that and they're an eighth that. You know, and that's not how dogs work. Like we made up the dog breeds. You know, it's a lens through which we look at dogs. You know, so where and, do dogs cut? Like, would, so where does the idea of breeds come from? Like, is it 
it came from uh, it came from in the in the Victorian era in like the late nineteenth century is when people started breeding dogs and they came up with the idea of a pure breed. Now there were differences in dogs before that, you know, like a dog from Ireland that had been, you know, bred like humans did breed dogs, they would breed it to like herd a sheep or something like that, you know, right. but they weren't like, this is the breed and this one is pure and that one's impure and I have its like documentation and whatever. And they're also and they also spoke Gaelic. Yeah, exactly. And there were a lot there were a lot fewer breeds too. It was they were mostly working dogs and things like that, you know. Um, uh, but then they they came up with this idea. They started basically breeding the dogs for fun or for as a hobby, you know. Um, and they and they created hundreds and hundreds of breeds. And then they and then they declared that okay, any dog that like sort of fits this standard is a pure breed, you know. And then they started like looking at the heritage of it, you know, they, and say it can only be a pure breed if it comes from you know the uh, uh, from a dog that is also uh, you know made that pure breed. But here's the thing. Those breeds have changed over time, you know, like a hundred after a hundred years of the bulldog, you know, being inbred that way, they've like the, the definition of the breed has actually migrated, you know? So, um, the, the point being that like, um, you know, uh, p- pure breeding is a way to look at dogs. You know, um, it's a it's a lens through which you know it's a circle to draw around certain dogs uh, that that uh, uh, describes them in a certain way, and it can be helpful in some circumstances. You know, it is true that that dogs of different you know are bred to have different temperaments and things like that. But if you if you uh, like really align yourself with that lens, if you're like that is the truth about dogs, right. you end up making a lot of bad decisions about them. And in that case, we show how it actually ends up hurting dogs because um, you know they end up getting very inbred. They have health problems, et cetera. How do we know? How do we know which questions to ask? Because you, <laughs> you've asked a, a ton, obviously. Yeah. Like, and, and, and to take a, the idea of a dog, my my pet, mm-hmm. and go like and build that sphere of knowledge around it. Yeah, you know, how do I know what questions to ask when I'm approaching any subject? Uh, like, how, what's your process of, of getting there? It's a good question. I mean, I, I'd ask uh, uh, all questions at all times. You know, <laughs> like <laughs> like I, I I'm not uh, you know I, I'm I think in every situation I'm I'm asking myself you know why do we do this. Um, uh, you know why? Why is the world set up this way? And the longer I live, the more I the more I realize that uh, the, you know the more questions I have. You know, um, uh, we're uh, uh, you know you're born into when you're born into the world. You know, you're sort of told like this is the way the world is. You know, and the, and it was uh, made this way on purpose, and everything is very well thought out. You know, that's what they sort of tell you when <laughs> right. you're a kid, and you go it's to done. school. It, the yeah. world is done. Yeah, we we we, we did Sleep it. You know, we, we we set it up this way on purpose. You know. Um, and then what I eventually realized is, and this is like a really, a really deep truth that I've been trying to find a way to express on the show. And and I I think about a lot is that the the fact is nobody, nobody set up the world, you know, nobody did it on purpose. Everyone was born into a world that they didn't make, you know? And then it was just like, oh, and this is how we do shit here. You know, like, oh, okay. How do they do things? You know? And then after a while, everyone goes like, wait a second. I think this is kind of set up wrong, you know, (laughs) in like a lot of, in a lot of respects. Right. Um, uh, the, the whole process is, is, uh, uh, I mean, isn't that bizarre, right? The, uh, yeah. uh, all all of human society is something that people were were born into without knowing why it was set up that way, and then they make a little tweak, and then they and then and then they move on, and then they die, and they move on, you know. Um, so it's like this this weird like accumulative like growing process, right? Um, uh, uh, there there was no uh, uh, you, you know even the founding fathers you know didn't didn't uh, uh, they, uh, you know they were they were uh, born in in the continental United States, and they were like, what the hell's going on here? Let's change it a little bit, you know. Um, um, uh, there's no, there's no, uh, you know, there was no, uh, prime creator who, who, uh, said this is the way things are and was like, did it very intelligently. So that means that, that, um, uh, basically everything is open to, is open to question, you know? Um, well, so, uh, I mean, it's a construct that we kind of all have heard before, which is question everything. Yeah. Right. Uh, you know, my wife, my wife's here because we were just fanning out as a family, which is pretty crazy. <laughs> like our, so our nice. two kids watch, like, um, that's so nice. and my, uh, our daughter goes to the first all girls STEM school in the state of California. It's a public school. Gal, shout out to Gala. But that's one of the big principles that they have at the school is question everything. That's great. Right. It is. And that's pro- uh, I would like to think that that's kind of kind of why we obsess with the show a little bit. Um, but that idea of questioning everything. Um, can that be introduced later in life? I think is there a yeah. process by which you like discover one thing and then like the, the higher you get on the, uh, in a vision 
vantage point, the more you see and the more you want to know? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think you just described it perfectly. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the... the um, I like asking people questions and then answering them. <laughs> before well, they... no, I mean, it was, a, it was a question that was so perfectly posed. All I could say is yes. That's, I mean, absolutely. I, I, I think, um, yeah, the more, the, the more questions you ask, the more questions you can ask, you know, and you don't need to, uh, uh, you, you know, I think people... Uh, feel, uh, you know, one of the reasons people don't do that is because it's, it's stable. It, it, it's stable and it feels safe to feel like you have the answers, you know, to say, right. I, uh, well, this is the, and, and you see that resistance to some people to, to the question, everything idea. They're like, no, 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 this is the way, this is the way things are. You know, um, uh, I remember having a, having a teacher in, in, in high school, uh, who, uh, you know, there was a math, uh, there was a, a math equation that I didn't understand. I was like, why is, I don't know. Do you remember effect? Do you remember factorial? No, that I, is? I don't. I don't. I, I was going to lie and say yes, and then I figured you might ask me a follow up question. <laughs> I was like, no, nah, I better be, better be honest. Um, I, I just remember <laughs> I, I have a very distinct memory of being in math class, and, and the way factorial works is five factorial. Oh, factorial, it, yes, yeah, is yes. Five times four times three times two times one, right? That's that's what so six factorial is six times five times four times three. You know what I mean? That's yes. the rule with factorial. And then, uh, uh, there, but there's a special rule where it's uh, uh, zero factorial is just one. I don't, you know, like, like, uh, two factorial is two times one, uh, one factorial is one times one. So, z so one, and then zero factorial is for some reason just equal to one. And I was like, I don't want, why is that? That doesn't make any sense. It breaks the whole rule. I don't get, why would that be? And my teacher got frustrated and she was like, she was like, Adam, that's just the way it is. This is in Florida. She was like, that's just the way, that's just the way it is. Okay. Like she didn't, she had no desire to, to find yeah. out what the answer was. Um, and, and it's, it's more, you know, it's that sort of like, uh, uh, you know, um, I don't want to use the word conservative because I don't mean it politically. I mean, I mean yeah. sort of like, like almost spiritually, like, like, you know, I don't want to mess too much stuff up. I like things are things are defined the way they are. And, uh, uh, I, you know, I'm very happy that they are that way. And that's just the way things are. And we don't need to question it at all. Um, that that feels, you know, at first more more stable, more comfortable to people. You know, I think but, that's also which is where the, the, the idea of disruption and innovation come from. Right. There's, yeah. It's it's. I'll, um, I'll use this word loosely, but it's reserved reserved for a select few, right? Because you, we we celebrate certain innovators like an Elon Musk or like mm -hmm. people that decided to go like, you know what? Maybe there is a different way of doing this, yeah. and there could be small like incremental innovations, like just maybe the way you travel to work one day. Yeah. Um, but it is that sort of muscle of getting in the practice of those small incremental questions and like starting to, to yeah. do it big, bigger. bigger. And, and I think it ultimately becomes more comfortable when you're in the habit of of questioning everything, yeah. you know, because uh, at least that's how. I, that's how I, uh, prefer to live, you know, like it's, it, it, because you, you start to realize that, um, that like, uh, you know, stability and certainty is a trap, um, uh, and that you're actually more flexible and more, more, uh, uh, more able in the world if you don't hold on to any idea too tightly. You know, if, if everything is, like we were saying about science earlier, if everything is a theory, you know, well, here's what I think right now, you know, but I'm open to having my mind changed, right. you know. Um, for one thing, it leads to way better conversations, right? Because if you're stuck on your idea and you're, uh, you know, you get an argument with someone and, and you'll never change each other's mind, you know, but but if you're, if you question everything, you can go into every conversation saying like, okay, well, well, I'm not, you know, here's what I think right now, but hey, hey man, change my mind. Like, well, I think I, you, it, know? There's a, you know, it's also like it's a catch-22 because I think in the age of social media, I'll use quotation marks, yeah. um, you know, we read a, a blog post or 140 characters and we're like, oh, I know about that subject now, right? We yeah. we have the, the you know, the myth that we are informed. Yes. For, and we don't question everything because we're like, oh, it's right, I Googled it. Yes. Um, you know, is have you discovered a way, because all your show is like, you know, sourced. Yes. And we know where it comes from yes. versus like, oh, I read a, a blog post about it and it had the five main yes. key, key things. Um, where do you explore beyond just that first dip your toe in the water? Like, okay, I got it. Um, uh, well, we, you know, uh, uh, here's the thing we do, you know, we're doing 16 episodes this year. And, um, uh, so, uh, you know, I wish I could dive, you know, incredibly deeply into every single one of our topics, you know, but we're doing, you know, 16 episodes. So times three topics per episode, you know, uh, what is that? 48, 48 different topics. You know? I, I, yeah. I still don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's so many. Uh, so very luckily I have a really 
really fantastic research staff that is able to like sort of dig into those things, dig into those things deeper, you know, and, and uh, we just sort of have to trust our process, you know, like um, I agree, uh, you know, you can't, um, uh, there is a trap if you look at, you know, just something you see on the internet and you read the the heading of every paragraph and you're like, I think I got it. And now this is my opinion. You know, um, uh, you do sort of need to go uh, deeper into these topics. And so, you know, our research staff, like we say, OK, we think we know what we're going to say here. And then they dive, dive, dive into the literature and, and really find out, you know, what the uh, you know, what the consensus in the field is and all that kind of thing. And that's something everybody can do for them. <clears throat> everybody can do that. Right. Um, uh, like it's. Uh, uh, you know, especially on our show, if you if you see it and you doubt a part of it, and I hope that people do. You know, I hope that people yeah. watch our show and they say, "Hey, I don't know if you're right about that," and they go look at our sources. You know, that's my favorite thing that people do with the show. Um, uh, anyone can go like go look at that source, go look it up. Uh, uh, do you dig publish it along with the episode? We so publish like, it. Yep, it's on our website. If you go to if you go to AdamRuinsEverything dot com, uh, it's got links to Adam's sources, um, and so it's a it's an extended bibliography for every episode. Um, and so anyone has that ability, you know, yeah. any, anyone can go in and read those things. Not, uh, not everyone has the time to do that for every single thing that they read, but having the ability to do that on a topic of interest to you is really, really important. And then after that, once you're like, well, I, I want to learn about things, but I don't have time to research them all that thoroughly. Well, then you want to look for sources that, you know, do their homework, right? So, so for instance, our show, you know, we have a research staff, you know, that we, we look everything up. And so you can watch our show and maybe take our conclusions with, with a little bit more confidence than, than another show that doesn't do that. I hope hope. Um, or, you know, if you're reading something, uh, you, you know, if you're reading like, for instance, the New Yorker, right? The New Yorker's got the best fact checking department mm. in the, in the, in the world. They're sort of, they have a famous fact checking department. Um, so, uh, you know, that if you're reading that magazine, okay, this thing has been fact checked within an inch of its life. So you know? trust the source in a, in a sense. Yeah. Well, you, you can, you know, you sort of, you can understand, uh, what, you know, uh, you don't trust them perfectly and implicitly. It's not to say they never make mistakes, but you know, if you know how they do their work, you can have more confidence. Confidence. You can be a more informed person when you read their work. Uh, let's talk about the business of, uh, of Adam Connell. Sure. Um, you mentioned team and research, and mm -hmm. you know, obviously, this is an extension of who you are as an individual, right? So these right. people, in a way, represent are you know tentacles of you, not to be confused with testicles yeah. of you. <laughs> um, no. So, I, like, what's your role in this team? Like, how do you cast the vision of, of, amongst the the team that helps you bring the vision to life? That's a really, really, really good question. Um, I'm still getting better at that. Um, it's very new to me. I, you know, w we started doing the show, uh, oh gosh, uh, a little over two years ago. We're, we're, so we're in our third year. Um, and before that, I was just a, I was just a comedy writer. You know, I just wrote sketch comedy for College Humor, the website, um, and I wrote for myself, you know. Um, and uh, the hardest thing has been, you know, scaling up and learning how to, you know, manage a team, not just in terms of like managing the, 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 you know, the people and the personalities, like uh, we're, we're pretty, we're pretty good at that. And I'm proud, I'm proud that we're uh, very, you know, uh, 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 careful about that. And, and, and I, and, you know, people, people are happy to work on a team with us, but to, in order to get uh, my sort of voice and my perspective, you know, on a show when, like I just said, I can't possibly, you know, do everything thing, you know, when we're doing 48 segments sure. a year, you know, um, uh, and we, you know, we write the whole show in about five or six months. Um, it, it, so it's, it's been a challenge to figure out how to, how to like sort of distribute my attention. You know, right now I still take the, the final pass on every one of our scripts, you know, um, uh, right after we finish recording this, I'm going to go home and I'm going to spend six hours working on the script. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, so I've been trying to figure out, uh, but you know, that, that, that doesn't scale up either. After a certain point, you're like, well, I want to do more work than is right. possible for me to for me to take that final pass on every script. So, um, uh, you know, I try to figure out like uh, I've been trying to get better at identifying like what am I, what exactly do I bring to the table? Like what am I, you know, what am I good yeah. at? Um, and and what is the part that that I can't possibly, uh, uh, you, you know, what, what is the special sauce that I bring? Um, for instance, it's not like joke writing, right? Like, like it's, uh, uh, a, after you do comedy enough, you're like, Hey, jokes are kind of cheap. Like we can write them. You know, we all know how to write them. If you're a good enough comedy writer, you know how to write jokes. Right. You can make people laugh. Um, uh, so, you know, that's something, okay, we have our writer's room. They can, they can handle doing that. Um, uh, uh, and you know, I can't possibly, you know, 
I, I can't possibly come up with all the pitches for the show myself. You know, I can't, it can't all be based on my own personal reading. I keep reading, I keep listening to podcasts and stuff like that to generate new ideas, but I can't possibly generate those myself. Those that has to be done by the room too. Um, I think what, uh, what I, uh, the way I see myself now is sort of the, Oh boy, what's the best way to put it? I think there's two, I think there's two, uh, two roles that I play. One is as the person who, um, uh, decides what it is that we want to say, you know, at the end of the day, I'm the person on television with the words coming out of my mouth, you know? Right. So everything that we do has to be something that I believe deeply in. Uh, that's an idea that, that, you know, appeals to me that I find interesting, you know, uh, and, uh, that I can stand behind. Do you, you know? ever question that part of it? Cause you know, yeah. sometimes, cause I, I sit in pitches all the time and sometimes I'm like, mm, I don't know if I like that idea, but then maybe f- the, the group consensus, oh, right? absolutely. The, a council of elders, if you will. Absolutely. Like, and I have to have that. I'm very, much a consensus based, uh, you know, decision maker where I, I'm the sort of person where it's like, okay, should we do this? And I go around the room. Do you think, do you, do you like this idea? Do you like this idea? Do you like this idea? If everyone likes it, then we can do it. You Are know? you all just scared that they're going to get fired if they say no? No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. It's very, very open. I really want everyone's opinion very genuinely. And I want, you know, and a really important part of working with people on the show, you know, working with other creative people, right. Is to make sure that what I, what I knew going in as a writer was, I was like, I want every writer on this show and every staff member on the show, you know, every producer, every, the makeup artist, everybody else. I want them to feel like this is the show where they get to do the real work. Like this is the show where they get to do the the work that got them into the business in the first place where they were, you know, they were that kid at home in the suburbs and they said, I'm going to move to LA and I want to work in TV because I want to, I want to make this shit that I'm watching on TV. Right. You know, I want to, I want to like, uh, you know, the work that they're inspired by and they want to make it themselves. I want them to be able to do that on our show. Um, so with the writers, that means sometimes, Hey, this is, you love this idea. I'm a little lukewarm on it a little bit, but because you love it, I think, I know it's going to be good, you know, right. um, et, et cetera. But then at the end of the day, you know, sometimes we do have a, a, a contrast where it's like, um, you know, it's, it, it goes both ways. Sometimes I have to say like, hey, you know, in my gut, in my heart of hearts, you know, I don't feel comfortable saying this on television or or I think, you know, this needs some more work or whatever. Um, uh, the other part of it is I'm the guy with the uh, – uh, I, I see myself as the uh, person whose uh, taste uh, is – uh, controlling the show is the wrong word, but um, uh, like I'm uh, it's the most the, influential. Like it's, it yeah. influences the direction. I'm the person who says like, "Hey, we th- this has to be better, right?" Um, that that's sort of like my main my main role is I'm looking at him, say, "Hey, you know what? This idea that we worked on this isn't up to our usual standards. This uh, uh, piece of writing, uh, y- you know, we, we we haven't quite got this argument right. You know, this um, uh, th- this bit of animation that we're doing. You know, hey, we need to take another pass on the background." Right. Or whatever, you know, um, uh, I think that's a really important role. Drives people crazy sometimes. Cause you know, it's like, Oh God, we gotta go do it again. You know, but, but, um, uh, like, is th- he just questioning everything again? Yeah. Does yeah. That, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's part well, of it. Actually know? does, I mean, does that ever become a hurdle? Right. Cause I, th- yeah. I think for, you know, do you ever come to a point of indecision because you oh. have so many different angles, all the you're t- in the habit all, of asking all the, so many questions all the time, all the time. And that, and that's, you know, in terms of, in terms of like, you know, when working on the show myself, when I'm, you know, uh, 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 you know, every moment I'm going, how can we make this a little bit better? You know, how can we make this a little bit better? Like, have we, have we, is this really the best version of the show that we're doing right now? You know, and there are times you have to say, okay, we got, just got to go shoot this thing, man. <laughs> you know, we don't have time. We don't have time to work over this line again. Um, and so that's a, that's a balance that, that, you know, I try to figure out because it's, you know, the, it's a really, you know, it's a, it's a time sensitive process, you know, making a TV show. We, we work really fast and uh, you know, I still have to, you know, you got to create space for yourself to, to still live a life while you're working on it. You know, yeah. um, you can't spend every moment, uh, tweaking and polishing, but you know, that sort of attention at the same time, if you, if you say, Hey, you know what, let's just uh, clock off at 5 PM every day, even though, uh, you know, regardless of how good, it, how good anything is right. Well, that's a recipe for, for bad work. So there's yeah. a, there's a, um, th- there's a balance to strike. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's funny because, uh, I don't, I've never considered myself, you know, the best, uh, you know, the smartest guy in the world, the most articulate guy in the world, the funniest guy in the world, the best host in the world. Right. But, um, uh, my judgment got me this far. So I got to sort of trust it as we're, as we're making the show. You no, know? That's, that's, that's great. Um, do you, 
do you like what what's the evolution of the Adam Conover brand, right? Like are you gonna debunk be debunking the world for the rest of for the rest of your career? <laughs> or are you like do you see a direction that this can go in, whether it's books or a course? I don't know. Like how have you thought to evolve evolve the brand? Well, the um you know, one of the uh uh, the the two things about that is is we started out with this idea of common misconceptions that was the main hook of the show you know we're gonna debunk common misconceptions you know and um, uh, that ends up being uh, that you know that that's what got people into the show initially and and it was really it was really powerful and it worked really well for us ends up being a little bit limiting because um, first of all any any interesting topic you then have to frame in terms of a common misconception you thought it was like this but it's actually like that right, right. well some things are interesting to learn about where you didn't have that fore notion of I thought it was like this I'm just you know like it makes it hard to tell stories about just well hey you just don't know this at all and we're just gonna tell you right you know so that ends up you know sometimes that ends up being a little bit of a tricky writing problem the other thing is, is it ends up being very declarative. You know, the current show is, is very much like, I'm going to tell you the way the world is, you know, and the more we do it, the more I realize, actually, this, this is a show about curiosity, you know, and it's about asking questions. Like we've been talking about the whole time. Why do we really know this? Hey, I want to know this. I want to know more, you yeah. know? And so, uh, that ends up being a tension with the format, the original format of the show, which is, you know, Hey, I'm going to come tell you why you're wrong. You know, like, like after a certain level, I'm like, Hey, I'm a comedian who likes to learn things. I I'm not the expert myself. I'm definitely not. We've got our research team. They know more than I do. We've got our ex we've got our actual experts on the show who we bring on who spent their whole life their whole lifetimes researching a topic, you know. That's uh, uh, those are the real experts. I'm just the guy who says, "Hey, I really I'm really curious about this. I want to make a TV show about it," you know. And there's a little bit of tension between what the character does on the show and uh, and, and that desire yeah. in me. So so uh, you know, the more the, the more I do this, the more I want to uh, I want to, you know, move to a place where we're talking about about, where it's about asking questions and where, you know, me and the audience are engaging in a process of discovery together uh, and, and a, a, you know, a process of question asking rather than me putting myself up on a pedestal and saying, you know, hey, I'm the guy with all the answers. This makes for a not. great uh, Reddit AMA series. <laughs> yeah. Uh, see, uh, there you go. Free, Absolutely. Uh, free, you just, are you writing it down? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, you know, as we sort of wind down, I do want to go through like a couple of the topics that you've covered on the show and just like, and maybe like one sentence or less um, mm -hmm. kind of just run through a little bit of what you learn or what, what the biggest misconception is about some of these things. Sure. You ready? Okay. Yes. And mouthwash. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Can we, let's, let's do it again. I'm sorry. That was my girlfriend texting me, and, and I had to reply. And I'm and I got she okay. Yeah, she's totally fine. She was like, "Do you want?" She was like, "I'm leave." She's like in this area, and she's like, oh, "I'll I'll give you a ride." And I was like, "Oh, in like 20 minutes when we'll be oh uh, perfect, I'll, I'll be, be perfect." So you're so telling me you only have 20 minutes? No, I'm just kidding. Yes, uh, that's no, fine. No, I mean, I think that's about, no, that's about no, what we had really, planned. No, we're good. Okay, so 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 uh, I'm gonna give you some stuff. You're gonna tell me what I don't know about it. Yeah. Mouthwash. Mouthwash uh, was originally, well, the uh, Listerine was originally a floor cleaner and a general household alcohol. Um, uh, but in order to sell more of it, uh, Listerine started advertising uh, around this idea of halitosis, which is a term they made up, which was a fake uh, uh, like a fake medical condition that they came up with where people uh, they, told, they told them that they had chronically bad breath that they couldn't even smell themselves and that was disgusting people and that they needed to uh, wash their mouths out with Listerine in order to get themselves a husband and stuff like that. It was pretty insidious. It's actually used in a lot of a lot of household, uh, especially toiletry products, especially aimed at women, are often telling them, you have a problem that you don't know about. You're dirty in a way that you didn't know about before and you need our product, our product to uh, clean it up. And the same same thing is used by, uh, you know, uh, 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 wipes, you know, like, like when they're, you know, like, Lister, uh, no, the, what, uh, flushable wipes, right? Yes. Where, fl Feminine flush wipes. Yeah. yeah fl uh, fl well, also for men, uh, dude wipes, dude, dude wipes for men. Dude right? wipes. And they Show say, wipes. And, and a lot of their advertising is based on, they're like, Hey, guess what? Your butthole is dirty and you didn't know it. And you need this pro you need our product well, that's to, true. to get your butt. And it, it works so well. You know, if <laughs> yeah. you're interested in marketing, Hey, that works well, but it's really dishonest and it makes people, sure. it makes people like afraid of their own bodies and it makes them insecure. And so I find that to be unethical personally. And so that's why we target that kind of marketing a lot on our show. Great. Uh, mother, 
Mother's Day? Uh, Mother's Day uh, was, let's see, it, it was it was come up with, I only have to remember this one because we recorded only a short segment on it about a year and a half ago, but I believe it was come up with as a, as a uh, the woman who invented it was so disgusted by the commercialization of it that she tried to get it like uh, ended. She tried to, she disavowed Mother's Day, but it was too late. <laughs> it was too late. Yeah. Uh, weddings. Uh, wedding. Well, that's a complicated one. Well, so, so a lot of our wedding traditions, uh, that we think of as being old, very old traditions, um, uh, like, uh, you know, stuff like something old, something new, borrowed blue, uh, uh, and then the, um, you know, the, the, oh, the idea that, that the, the bride and the bridesmaid should have matching gowns, you know, that sort of thing. Um, the fact that like, uh, men wear tuxedos, but basically think about it. Um, when at a wedding, Everyone is kind of pretending to be rich at a wedding, right? Everyone is like, like men wear tuxedos, right? That's like the only time you'll wear it. For most people, it's the only time you'll wear a tuxedo, right? Who normally wears tuxedos? Like millionaires, right? At like fancy balls and things right. like that, you know? All right, one more. Black guys. No, just kidding. Ah! Um, <laughs> death. Death. Um, I mean, we did a whole segment on the show about how like you're going to die one day, you know? Um, and it was really funny. For our first season, it was like, you know, common misconceptions, right? Um, uh, <laughs> that, that was the whole theme. And I was like, and we were in our writers room. We were like, what's the biggest misconception of all? It's that you're not going to die one day. You know, <laughs> that people believe deep down they're not going to die. Right. Like they, they, they know they're going to die, but they don't really believe it. You know, it's not like in, it's not in them, you know? And so we looked at, we did a whole episode about uh, mistakes that people make because they don't accept that they're going to die um, uh, because they, they viscerally reject it. And so one is that, you know, for instance, people get these, you know, uh, when they're in the last years of their lives, they get these these uh, horribly damaging medical treatments that maybe only extend their life by a month, but make the last two two years of their lives a living hell, you know, like um, when when if they had just sort of stayed at home and let the let the disease take in its course, they would have had a much more comfortable, a much more comfortable. Now, that, that, I, don't, I don't give people medical advice, but sure. That is that is a problem. You know, this this guy Atul Gawande uh, wrote an incredible book called Being Mortal about that uh, very issue, and it, it's about how you know there there are people who really reduce the quality of their life because they um uh, and and it's not just the, them that do it. Sometimes it's it's their their doctors or their or their children will will say, oh no, we gotta try, we gotta do everything, you know, because the person didn't make a decision before they died, right. before they you know the person who slips into a, a coma or whatever, and then and then their kids are feel guilty, like ah, just give them the works, and this person ends up you know, hooked up to a machine just because, you know, people are trying to make it last as long as possible, you know, whereas if you really faced your death beforehand and said like, okay, what would I want in the event, you know, that I, that I were in this circumstance? Um, well, you know what? I, I don't think I would want to be hooked up to a machine. I think I'd want to be at home with my friends and family, even if that means I live a little bit less long, you know? Um, uh, and so if you can face the fact that you're going to die, really take it seriously yep. and make those decisions beforehand, you can end up with a much better end of life. So that's what, you, what that episode's about. What do you want your funeral to be like? Oh, geez. Well, we talk about on the show natural burial, um, which is uh, when you don't get a coffin, you just um, are sort of like covered in a shroud and, and uh, uh, buried. Um, people decompose very quickly. And, and mm. so, I mean, that's that's the way people used to be buried until the rise of the funeral industry, um, which is a whole other sort of mm. rapacious business. Um, uh, uh, so that's, uh, yeah. Um, All right, in a shroud. I, I'll keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, as we wind down, a <laughs> sure. couple, couple more questions Please. and then uh, we'll I'll let you we'll get to meet your girlfriend. Please. Uh, um, um, the show is called Innovation Crush. You've seen a lot. You know a lot. Um, what do you see out in the world that you're just currently crushing on? What's impressing you the most? What's giving you goosebumps? What's making you go like, ooh, that? You know, the Nintendo Switch, I think, mm. is really, if I'm a huge, I play a lot of video games. Yeah, Adam um, plays everything. I wanted to talk oh, about yeah, that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. I, I've I, seen I, your sub brands. Oh, cool. Yeah, I've been trying to figure out a way to do some more video game content. It's hard because it takes a lot of work and there's so many people doing it. But I love video games. I love talking about them. So I'm trying to find a way to do that. Um, and, uh, 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 but, you know, I've been a Nintendo fan my whole life, and Nintendo's been a company that's had a lot of trouble the last couple of years, you know. Um, and with their new console, everyone was like, oh, my God, they got to nail this or they're done for. They're going to get bought by Disney or something if they don't, you know, if they – if they, I mean, that would uh, – The danger of all of us, I think. And that would be sad. You know, Disney would probably do a good job making games and everything. But, like, Nintendo, I want them to exist yeah. as, a, as a company. You know, I really care because they're they're like, you know – they're just the, the they're they're Willy Wonka's chocolate factory, you know. They're they they like uh, uh, they they make some of the best games in the world. And they've got this culture and this thing that I don't want to see leave. And then, so the Nintendo Switch is. Have you played one? No, I've but I love the. I mean, I love the way it's all set up. It's, it's great. It 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 they just nailed it so perfectly. The idea of you know this idea of like okay, it's it's on your TV. If you haven't seen it, it's like a console where it sort of looks like uh, an iPad with controllers on the side, right? Um, but then you can dock it. It's got this little thing just 
just slides right in, dock it, the image Im immediately goes on your TV, and then the two controllers that are on the side slide off, and you put them on a little handle, so and dope. now you're playing. Now you're yeah. playing on your on your um, on your TV. And at first, I was like, okay, maybe I'll use that. But um, you know, it came out with with this incredible Zelda game that's one of the best video games ever made. I was playing it on my TV, and then I was like, um, you know, for the first time, I was like, uh, I was actually flying, and and I. Uh, uh, I, I I came back from India. I was there for a week, and I, when I came back, I had the, the jet lag was so bad I had terrible insomnia, you know. And so one night I couldn't sleep, and I just picked the thing up off the off the the console and and started playing it on the couch. And I was like, this feels so good, you know. Suddenly, yeah. and I can take this, and I can take it anywhere. I can play Zelda at home, and then I can go take it, you know. I can play it in my trailer on set, you know. And um, it, it it it's so well executed, such a simple idea, so well executed that now, and I've talked to other fans, other friends of mine who who are big video game fans, we're all like, we want to play everything on this like and if a game comes out on the switch or anything else i want to play it on the switch you know even though the hardware is not as you know not as powerful as playstation by by a long shot you right. know um even though it's got like it's not it's not perfect like it's got other little piddly problems you know like um uh, if, if you're a tech journalist you'll criticize this that or that about it you know um the core concept is so fresh and so well executed that it's like uh, you know that i'm i'm just obsessed with it yeah yeah no because the gaming experience is definitely like you're tethered to a special for you know, yeah, for a and, second. and now I feel like uh, I'm not tethered. You know, like like when I have to play a game on my PlayStation because that's all it's out on. I'm like, wait a second, I can only play this on my TV. I can't take it. You know, I can't take it on vacation with me. What a ripoff! Like I, I suddenly feel like it's it's one of those products where you suddenly feel like all of its competitors are suddenly missing an essential feature. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, um, like why don't why don't why can't they all do this? Um, and and so that's a really you know, and that's what Nintendo does, right? Like that's what Nintendo has historically always done. That I could talk about Nintendo for a thousand years, but you know, <laughs> but they but because they're not just a hardware software company, right? They're sort of like a toy company. Like they they create the whole experience, you know. They create they and they make it all work together. And so they've constantly innovated. I mean, you like innovation. They've constantly innovated. They came up with, um, uh, you know, uh, controllers that vibrate. They invented portable gaming. Yep. They invented motion control, you know. And then sometimes their innovations, they don't work well. The Wii U, huge flop. You know, motion control, uh, no one's really doing that as much anymore. Um, you know, uh, uh, the two screens and the Nintendo DS, you know, some people like it, some yep. people don't, right? But, um, the running what, pad for when they had the... Uh, exactly. <laughs> but, but, how, but how memorable and fun Power was that? You know? Yeah, like all that stuff. They're always inventing that extra thing that you're going to buy that that makes their games something that you can only play on their console and makes it distinct. And sometimes it doesn't work that well and, and they, and they waste a lot of money on it. But then when it works, it's just such a, they just invent a new way to play that no one else does. What Meanwhile, is, Sony and Microsoft are just like making a more powerful box, a more powerful black box to put under your TV and you play the same types of games on it. You know, I mean, that's where like, I feel like that's where like good risk comes in, right? Like yeah. not being afraid to just try stuff, you know, it took PlayStation how long to come out with their VR. Like they talked about it for years and we were yeah. like oh playstation vr it's coming it's coming and then they just never like it took a very long time for them to release it where you've got like the nintendo example like shit let's give them a glove let's give them a, a pad to run on let's yeah, <laughs> let's yeah. just let's just try it and see yes. and see what sticks yes um last but not least sure complete this phrase for me sure innovation to me is <laughs> oh uh let's see that's a really good question um uh, it's hard to think of something that doesn't just sound like a buzzword. Innovation to me is creating the future disruptively through my passion. Oh, write that down. <laughs> right, just write that down. It was a good one. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think that um, – uh, I do think it's one of those words that I think people can have a tendency to chase too much as an end in itself, sure. where it's just like, you know, I'm just going to innovate for the sake of innovating. Like you want to make sure that you're, that you're doing it well, <laughs> you know what I mean? That you're doing yeah. it in a good direction. Um, uh, that you're well informed. But, especially. Yeah. Yeah. But I, but I do think it's, I do think it's pretty essential. You know, I, I think one of the reasons, um, people like our show is that it, is that it doesn't look um, it doesn't look like any other show they've seen before. You know, it, 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 it it's, it's recognizable, um, uh, like how it's supposed to work, but it, it's got like a different format and a different, a different sort of subject matter. Um, and you know, when I think about the shows that really meant a lot to me, you know, like, like, uh, uh you know, you know, why, why is, you know, why is John Stewart, you know, the Johnny Carson of this, of this generation is because he created a new format, you know, um, or, I mean, he didn't create it initially, actually, Liz Winston, Madeline Smithberg did, who were the original EPs of the daily show, but, um, there he uh, goes. 
full credit to them. Well, well, I want to <laughs> no, make sure you know. I want to no, make sure great. they get. Bad. I want to make sure they get credit for no, that. I love you know? that but I, love, I just love that. That's this is genuinely the fact of who you are. Like, yeah, you just, yes, you know. yes. <laughs> um, but you know, that was a. It was. It, it was. A, uh, you know, the Daily Show. As once it came into its own, um, uh, it was. You know, re- recognizable, right? Because it's parroting a news show, but it's also something brand new, you know? And so that's why it sort of hooked people. And then it created a template that for other people to follow, you know? And so I think that's I think that's uh, uh, pretty essential. Like, people want that, you know, people want that spark of newness, you know? And yeah. it's a problem where people want both things, you know? Like, like they want the thing that's what they... I mean, just uh, uh, the, the, they want the thing that's recognizable to what they had before, and they want something new. And and actually, just speaking about Nintendo again, right? The new Zelda game, for example, mm-hmm. like those games were getting old hat. Like like I've played every Zelda game. I love them, and I want that Zelda feeling that I get every time that I get when I play a Zelda game. You know, that's why I'm buying the Zelda game because I want to feel 13 years old again. You know, I, and I want some of those nostalgic things. I want yeah. some of the same theme music. I want some of the same enemies. I want I, I, I do want that feeling, right? But at the same time, they were getting too similar. You know, like like one of the Recent ones, uh, Zelda, Skyward Sword for Wii, I think. I didn't even end up playing because because I heard it. it was like, oh, this is if you've played Zelda before, you, you know what this is. And I was like, okay, then maybe I don't need to play it. You know, for the new game that came up with Breath of the Breath of the Wild, it's like this brand new take on 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 how the game works. You know, it's like it's open world in this way. It's it's they 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 got rid of a lot of a lot of old tropes. They they you know they remixed a lot of it, but it has the same feel. Does that make sense? Yeah, of course. It's got it's the perfect mix of old and new. And I think that's what you I think that's what you need to go for. You know, that's that's why like. Uh, um, you know, why is Guardians of the Galaxy a bigger hit than the Avengers? You know, it's because it's like, well, it's got that it's got that same feel that I want, but it's also I've never seen these characters before. I've never seen this world before. It's also fresh and new, you know. Um and, and so I think that's the most important part is to is to mix old and new together. So innovation to you is what? No. <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't speak. I don't speak in half, half sentences. No, okay. um, <laughs> all right. Well, uh, where can people find you? Where did they find uh, Adam Conover? Oh, world? you're really gonna follow me on Twitter. Um, uh, and uh, but hey, you can watch uh, Adam. Adam ruins everything. New episodes coming back. Oh, I think they're coming back. Jul- I think I can say now, July 11th. Um, July 11th on True TV, 10 p.m. Tuesdays. Um, nice. All this year. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for stopping by. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. I really appreciate it, too. I'm glad we got the bourbon at the same time. Yeah.